So in this video, we're going to look at two different types of art, mannerism and Baroque. Okay? And we're going to start with mannerism. Now, for each art style, at the end, you should be able to tell me what does it try to express, what, like what's the point of it, what are its characteristics, and name an artist of the movement to use as an example. And we're going to start with mannerism. Mannerism tries to express intense emotion and feelings of ecstasy, often religious ecstasy, a mystical experience, a religious, intense religious experience. Right? And its characteristics are that it begins to break some of the re uh, Renaissance art rules. The Renaissance art tried to look super realistic. Mannerism does not try to do that because it's trying to express reality, not how you see it, but how you feel it. So it fudges some of the rules a bit. Everything with mannerism is, is, is often a little bit different, a little bit odd, a little bit strange. Right? If you look at this example, this is a painting by El Greco, right? the Greek. He was from Greece, but he made his fame and fortune painting in Spain. This is a painting of St. John the Apostle. And notice everything's a bit, well, different. Uh, it's out of proportion. His head seems a little too small for his body. His neck is elongated. So are the fingers. Uh, the colors have a bit of an eerie tone to it. Even the skin tone of St. John is a little bit off. The background, right? There's really nothing in the background. No object in the background. So you focus on St. John. And yes, that is a serpent coming out of the cup, by the way, because according to church legend, someone one time poisoned the communion wine. St. John prayed over it, and the poison came out in the form of a serpent. Another painting by El Greco. Once again, you have that, that same color palette uh, with, with the grays, and everything's just a little bit off. Everything's a little unrealistic, a little eerie, a little mystical. That's the point of it. You see Christ in the center, and you see the Virgin Mary in blue and red, and right beside her, St. Peter in yellow, dangling keys. Remember the keys in St. Peter's? And beside Mary is St. John the Baptist, which you can see in his camel skin. Even notice how some of the angels in the clouds blend in with the clouds. They're not well defined, giving a sense of oddity, the eerie, the transcendent, the mystical, the incomprehensible, right? That's what you're trying to express. One more of El Greco. This is the birth of Christ. Same color palette again. Same skin tones again. The figures seem a little elongated, stretched out, out of proportion. And notice the source of light is not realistic either. It's not a lantern or a candle. It's Christ himself. Notice how the light is projecting from the Christ child. Right? Our second style of art is Baroque art. Right? And so what does it try to express? It's power. It tries to express power, whether political or religious. And it often does this through being very ornate. Very fancy, to use an easier word. Very detailed, very rich, very ostentatious, to use a really long word there. It's very much in your face. There's nothing subtle about Baroque art because there's nothing subtle about power. So you look at the architecture of a Baroque designer named Bernini. He designed what you see in front of you, St. Peter's. Right? Uh, and, and, and notice, right, Notice how large everything is, how extravagant everything is. Uh, notice how teeny tiny the, the people look compared to the giant columns that surround St. Peter's. Also, notice the outline of the buildings. It's in the shape of a key. And remember in El Greco's painting, you saw St. Peter dangling keys. Because according to church tradition, St. Peter was the first pope, and the pope has the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Right? Uh, so oftentimes, anytime you see keys in Catholic religious art, that either refers to St. Peter or to the Pope. Then you go inside St. Peter's, and everything is big and rich and fancy and ornate. It's designed so when you walk in, you automatically start to whisper, right? because you just know you're in some place special. Right? You're not, it's not designed to make you feel at home like a lot of modern day churches 
They have their little cafes and their couches. It's designed to make you feel a little uncomfortable, but in a good way to remind you that you're in a place of power. In this case, religious power. And in the foreground, you see the canopy of St. Peter's. To give you a little perspective on how big it is, you can see the gentleman standing there. But you know how big it actually is. And according to church tradition, and they're pretty sure it's true now, right beneath that canopy is the burial place of St. Peter's, who the Catholic Church says was the first pope. And and in the background, you see the throne of St. Peter. So, uh, according to church tradition, this is the chair St. Peter sat upon while in Rome, and they, uh, Bernini had it encased in bronze, right? And it's being held aloft by four great figures of church history, St. Ambrose and St. Augustine, St. John, and St. Athanasius, who wrote a very interesting book on the Trinity, by the way, just throwing that out there. Once again, there's nothing really subtle about this it's very large it's very in your face it's very much saying look at me right look at this power once again in this case religious power right you look at some of the paintings this is a painting by my favorite Baroque artist Caravaggio right he is painting that scene where uh, uh, Christ appears to the Apostles after his resurrection and he gets Thomas uh, to touch his wounds. You can see the expression of surprise on Thomas's face as his finger goes into the wound of Christ. Love this painting. And, uh, and it, this is about religious power once again. And notice the background is all in black, right? To make the figures pop, to make you pay attention to them, to make you pay attention to the power of the moment. You see it in here too, that same black background. You see that a lot in Baroque art, particularly Caravaggio's. This is David holding up the severed head of Goliath. Notice the source of the light is coming from the bottom. It's not realistic either, kind of like mannerism, right? They're abandoning some of the rules of Renaissance art. Side note, some scholars think Caravaggio painted himself into the painting as Goliath, as the villain of the story, because he had his own personal demons, particularly alcoholism, that he struggled with with his entire life. This is another scene from the Old Testament, that black background, the light coming from the bottom, once again, an expression of intense power, in this case, the power of violence right so mannerism emotions and ecstasy baroque power then your book did shift gears and talked about literature now we're not going to talk about all of the literature in the book i don't need you to remember all of it but there is a biggie that you need to remember and you probably already do the greatest playwright of the elizabethan era Shakespeare, right his works are classics right think about it people have read and performed his books for centuries, when we're all dead and buried, we will still read Shakespeare. It will still be performed after us, right? You could probably name one of his plays. He did comedies. He did tragedies. He did histories. He made up words that we still use today, right? So he had a huge influence on Western literature and on the English language. I challenge you to simply Google words Shakespeare made up or phrases that he made up and see how many we still use today. 